If you see, as I do, this as one of the potentially biggest industries the globe has ever seen. You heard the term pothead and all of those things, and I'm not a pothead. I, I just desperately need sleep. Brayden has been seizure-free since 42 minutes after his first dose. Week by week, we're seeing more and more patients. The scare tactic um, did not work. It's never going to work. I have cancer, and uh, I also have various arthritis. -ses. And I have many other conditions that are wrong with me, okay? And sleep is absolutely necessary so that your body can heal. And I had been, I've tried every single sleep medication there is and all the other techniques that they want me to use and nothing works, absolutely nothing works. So uh, I was at a naturopath's office and he suggested medical marijuana and I, I got it and they told me that I could have three grams a day. Well, I don't need three grams a day, I, just a little tiny bit and I take it uh, just before I'm ready to go to bed, okay? And as soon as I feel the effects, I stop reading, I stop watching television, and I go straight to bed. And now I'm getting six and seven hours of sleep every night, which is just wonderful. And my body says thank you very, very much. Well, you heard the term pothead and all of those things, and I'm not a pothead. I, I just desperately need sleep, and I need something to control my pain, too. So I will be taking it for uh, when I force myself to take it and if I see that it's going to reduce my pain, then I'm going to say, well, screw it. If it's helping me with my pain, I'm going to take it, okay? I don't care what anybody says. Uh, the other thing with my cancer is uh, everybody's really worried about my appetite. Well, I'm worried about gaining weight. I have such a good appetite now. <laughs> I have a much better appetite than I had before. And it helps with the nausea, too, from the chemo. So it, it is, I, I think if anybody has cancer, they, they should be taking some, some pot to help them with the nausea. Well, actually, they're very good with all the medications they give you with it. But you still get nauseous, okay? And, uh, but I found that because I've been using it for sleep, I, I haven't been nauseous. I have no energy to exercise. I mean, just the thought of moving was... <laughs> <laughs> really bad, okay? So, and, and now I feel like I have enough energy that I can exercise, so I will be starting one of the programs at the rec center very shortly. Aurora Cannabis is a federally licensed producer of medical cannabis. We believe through the careful construction of the only purposeful built facility in Canada that we have the potential to produce the highest quality medical cannabis this country has ever seen. Our mission is to do this cleanly, safely, and consistently so that our customers who buy our cannabis can expect from batch to batch that it's always consistent, just like any pharmaceutical medicine would be. The big thing though is getting to a point where the dosaging is exactly the same each time. And we're working on a number of different deals that have been publicly announced, like the Mistibus. Um, that's an amazing device that's going to be an inhaler, yet you're not decarboxylating, you're not heating the product, so you're not smoking it. And then of course with the Owen Smith ruling allowing edibles, we're going to be uh, providing a, a pill form of cannabis that will be an exact dosage. And, and, and move. A lot of moving away from the stigma is moving away of smoking a joint to get rid of a headache. It's, it's not like that at all. We have understood from the beginning that there are a large number of medical patients representing a large number of medical conditions. It's not an easy thing to meet the demands of most people, but people like our chief cultivator, Chris Meyerson, and others as part of the Aurora team, we've done our best to ensure that the strains we grow, which is over 20, represent the largest number of medical conditions we could possibly reach with our product. Today, I'm happy to 
show you what is the highest CBD percent strain currently being produced in Canada. The strain is called Canatonic, which is the same strain known as Charlotte's Web in the United States. So what you see in this room is the highest CBD containing strain in Canada currently. We're in the process of harvesting it. So we started flowering um, several weeks ago and this is the final process of maturation. What the people are doing, they're taking the colas and a cola is a large branch or cluster of buds and they're rendering them down into individual buds so that our automated trimmer can remove any remaining leaf material. Patients and clients don't want the leaf, they want just the flower itself. That makes the most desirable product. Most people understand cannabis has a psychoactive effect. High CBD strains, such as this Panatonic, have no psychoactive effect, just pure medical effect. And one of the greatest uh, privileges of being able to produce such a medicine today is that childhood epilepsy, which is a big problem that people are just learning about. This is the type of strain that can produce a medicine suitable for young children. We have a combined 50 years of cannabis cultivation at this facility, both indoor and outdoor which ensures that the product is grown in a way that best supports the plant from crop to crop to crop to crop. So together these cultivators along with the scientists both meet the perfect synergy of science plus art to make a reproducible drug product. And then our, just our propagation team, the degrees span everything from plant science to environmental biology to chemistry, and other specialized focus degrees. I think well over half to 60% of the people in the facility have advanced science degrees. Well, certainly there's um, an abundance of knowledge out there in, in, the, uh, in the market, but it, some of it was in the black market. Uh, so that was a challenge, getting the proper people on board to help with the design of the facility. And once we completed the design and had the meetings around the grow and what mediums we were going to use and whatnot. The next challenge was the regulatory environment for sure. Because it was new, the MMPR was new, um, and it was only 13 or 14 that were approved, and you know, we think they were approved rather quickly because they had to be, they started taking their time on approval. And the standards that Aurora had to meet, it seemed to be get, keep getting higher and higher each time Health Canada uh, came around because they were learning and we were learning, so we had to be very patient with them. Uh, they had to be patient with us, and we, you know, that was one of the major um, hurdles in, in getting to know exactly what the standard was going to be. And it's still being developed. We still get different opinions from different auditors, but there is a, a lot more consistency than it was two years ago. This material is quarantined because, as part of the quality assurance process, it's not enough that we grow the material, it's not ready for sale at that point. We first have to send this to the lab to check the THC and CBD percentages. We have to check the microbial content. We check for the absence of pesticides, and we check for heavy metal content, as well as the absence of a few other microbials that we're concerned about. So until our quality assurance director reviews those lab results, reviews the batch record, it stays in quarantine. Once she reviews everything and her experience says, yep, it passes everything, then it becomes released like this material off to the right. This material, which is LSD, is a strain we've been selling since we started sales. So right now, medical marijuana is regarded by a good number of physicians as a fourth line agent. That means they've tried the first drug, they've tried the second drug, they've tried the third drug or the third treatment, now they're out of options. That leaves a large number of people uh, without options. Sometimes those fourth line drugs could be more powerful drugs or maybe experimental drugs, but unfortunately, those drugs can have side effects. So for a lot of individuals who don't wish to use more chemicals or more drugs in their lives, cannabis allows them 
to use a, a drug that has relatively few side effects, especially if eaten or vaporized, to make their lives better. It's, um, it's, it's a powerful thing to be able to make people's lives better when they feel there isn't another option for them. It's a wonderful plant with a, with a wonderful um, host of different um, approaches. There's, there's different types of, of uh, cannabis. You've got uh, sativa and indica. Those two plants do totally different things in medicating. Uh, many of ours are blends of those. Um, there's the high CBD plants that can be used to treat small children with Dervais syndrome that have literally no THC. So there's no psychoactive effect, um, yet the CBDs are the ones providing the medicine. You can't argue the medical um, aspects of this drug, certainly not with MS, appetite, nausea, neuropathic pain, um, and a number of other ailments, it just, it works. If you see, as I do, this as one of the potentially biggest industries the globe has ever seen since uh, computers or software, if you see it in that way, then there's nothing holding you back from growing in the company, growing in the industry, and potentially entering a global job market. Um, I find that exciting. The future is wide open and it can be defined by anybody. Medical cannabis is um, a new development in the Canadian history of marijuana. Um, in 2014, it was passed that patients could use it legally as long as they had a medical prescription. Natural Health Services is a full-service medical cannabinoid clinic. Um, we're the only clinic in Western Canada that doesn't charge for our prescription writing service. Um, we help from everything from uh, education on how the system works and the MMPR legislation, all the way up to registration and liaising between the patient and the licensed producers. We have the patient come in, so let's say for instance, the patient comes in with a doctor's referral, so they've got a diagnosis for cancer, let's say. Um, so we hook them up with, uh, with um, the booking software, so they actually book the appointment. They come into our clinic, they sit down and they do a 30 minute to 45 minute consult with our doctor. Um, at that point, the doctor hands them off to the education professional, so we have people who actually give them a generalized starting point based on what their symptoms are um, in regards to which strains would be best for them to use. So it's, uh, it's, it's super important for us to be understood um, as a specialty clinic and not as the place where you just go to get weed. Well, certainly in Calgary, it's changed the landscape a lot. Um, we have um, offered a full cannabis-only clinic for patients, and um, the growth has been exponential. The results have also been quite amazing in that there are very few people that cannabis has not helped with very few side effects and um, long-term concerns around addiction and that kind of thing. So it is a valuable medication and I never thought I'd be saying that. We do a short time follow-up on our first prescription. Um, so when we see a patient after the first 30 or 45 days, it is even, there's a noticeable difference at that point, even in that short period of time. Not with everybody, but the most, the, for the most part, the majority of people are seeing positive reaction to cannabis within the first 30 to 45 days. Um, you know, without generalizing every patient, because we do see a, a wide array of different symptoms, there are, uh, there are a ton of patients that are seeing positive results in the form of being able to reduce pain medication, substantial pain medication, sleep medication, any kind of sleeping pills. We're seeing a lot of people go completely off of sleeping pills and switch completely over to cannabis to help them sleep. Um, you know, from an anti-anxiety and anti-depression standpoint, same situation. We're seeing a lot of people cut back their medication, their anti-anxiety and anti-depressant medication. So it is, uh, it's a big deal. It's very, uh, it's very impactful when you see this many patients come through with this amount of positive reinforcement. Um, I mean, without even speaking to the pediatric patients, the pediatric patients that we see come through here have actually been quite motivating as well. Well, I, I believe very strongly that um, this should not be restricted to any age group. We have a 94-year-old woman who is doing very well, um, who is suffering from nerve pain. And we have um, patients as young as two years old. When it comes down to cost-benefit ratio and, and um, doing no harm, cannabis is far less harmful than a lot of the medication that is prescribed for seizures, for example, 
and also surgical procedures that um, are invasive and hard to recover from. Well, the obvious side effects, I mean, once, once you're consuming cannabis, you're going to feel that, you know, depending on what the levels of the chemicals that exist and the strains that you've chosen, you're going to feel the high effect, right, the euphoric effect. But oftentimes, you know, in terms of pain control and, you know, antidepressant and post-traumatic stress disorder, that's exactly what the patients are looking for. I mean, you know, there's the traditional ones, you're going to get hungry, you know, Lots of people come in here for, for appetite issues as well too, so that's, that's, you know, some people might see that as a negative side effect, but lots of people see it as a positive side effect because that's the exact reason why they're using it, just to try and increase their appetite. Yeah, that's the next what I see is relief, that patients are feeling normal, their pain is reduced, and it's not just that they don't care about the pain, it is that the pain is actually reduced. Um, people with um, inflammatory bowel disease report, report fewer symptoms. Um, people with migraines report the migraines go away. Um, that's not for everybody, not everybody's a success story, but the vast majority of people that come in derive some benefit from cannabis for sure. Brayden has epilepsy um, and an undiagnosed neurogenetic condition. Um, it's sort of like being knocked out. Oh, it was horrendous. Um, we couldn't, Brayden couldn't bathe alone. He would seize all night. He would seize on the playground at school. Um, he had two broken legs um, from an accident at school. He had 32 stitches to his head because of a seizure. Um, he could never be left alone. He um, didn't play with his siblings. He didn't want to interact. He um, didn't even want to interact with his own parents. Um, it was really difficult. Um, seizure meds, doubling seizure meds, doubling seizure meds some more just living with his condition. Um, a lot of hospital stays, we've been in the hospital, I can't even count how many times he's been in there. Um, a lot of surgeries. He does have a pacemaker for the brain, a VNS implant. Um, so it's an implant that's in his chest, um, has wires that go up the vagus nerve, and it shocks his brain every five minutes, um, paralyzes his vocal cords, causes him inconsolable screaming fits. It's called a Venus implant. My voice like gets all like vibrating. September 20th of this year, we started him on cannabis. Brayden has been seizure free since 42 minutes after his first dose. The syringe kind of just like sometimes go fast and like hits the back of my throat. That's why I like the drops better. Um, I found out who my son was. Um, he's happy, he smiles. We just bought his first bike. It's cool. Um, it's sort of yellowish green. So we're just starting to see more of Brayden. He's not comatose, he's not in a drug state, he's not high on seizure pills anymore. And cannabis does not make him high. Um, we're just learning a lot more about Brayden and who he is and what he enjoys. And um, just meeting our kid for the first time in seven years. Brayden now plays with his siblings. He, um, he's making friends. It's, it's been really positive, really positive experience.
I don't ever want another mom to feel how I had to feel before September. Um, I've referred many patients to Steve at Natural Health Services that he has been able to help um, my goal in life for the rest of my life that Braden is here is to help other kids and other families and anybody facing any of the same problems. It seemed so difficult and I had a lot of support through a lot of friends um, who had children on cannabis um, and it, it really did seem impossible but I did not care. I would travel to Vancouver, I would travel anywhere. I had nothing left to do to save my son and give him a quality of life. My name is Dr. Donald Richard Cook. I'm a clinical assistant professor here at the University of Calgary, uh, Cummings School of Medicine. Uh, I wanted to give a disclosure prior to comments with respect to cannabis. I don't have any stocks or bonds or investments in the cannabis industry. I have not prescribed cannabis for any patient to date. I have no affiliations with any medical clinic or naturopathic clinic. I have received consulting honorariums in the past for some pharma companies for my expert opinion in my special areas of interest uh, for lipid disorders and cardiovascular risk management. Well, my position on the use of medical cannabis is um, that it is legal, um, it's a, a potent therapy, and that is, it is, um, has uses, and it also has abuses. Um, so for medical therapy, I think that it has benefits, um, and um, I think that those are important benefits that need to be added to our medical arsenal of therapy. A year ago, I was not even thinking about medical marijuana. Um, the education that physicians get is typically that marijuana is um, a drug and potentially a gateway drug. Um, so we as doctors have shied away from even looking at medical marijuana as a possible alternative. The other issue is um, uh, risks of the addiction rate. Um, obviously, um, with the cannabinoid receptors being in our body, um, that we are made to have cannabinoid, well we have receptors and we have uh, hormones which affect that. These are kind of like our pleasure centers and our natural um, um, need for things like reward, things like pleasure, things like physical activity, things like purpose. So we naturally have those. The, the cruel trick of when we add cannabis products to our natural center is that they, they enhance those things in the short term, but the cruel effect is that they suppress those things because you make less and less of your own as you are more and more dependent on the exogenous agent. It um, has issues, so, however, of attention. It can impair you when you're uh, operating a motor vehicle. Um, it has changes in risk-taking decisions and, uh, and impacts your working memory. So those um, uh, are, are some of the acute effects. And the other cruel trick is because of the long-term effects, which can affect uh, the way the brain actually works, uh, can affect uh, ca um, the way the brain connects. Um, that's really the biggest concern of doctors over the long term is some of the, the brain structural change effects in particularly young uh, users um, who, or heavy users over time. Um, dosing issues um, are medically uh, a, a nightmare. They're a nightmare because every plant is different. Every form that we extract it from is different. And um, the um, knowing just how many milligrams uh, it, you're getting out of that particular plant is variable. Uh, what combinations of THC and CBD is variable. Uh, and smoking is just not good for us. End of story. Medicine is littered with the carcasses of therapies which we thought were great. One of the one that comes to mind is thalidomide. Thalidomide was a phenomenal drug to stop nausea in pregnant 
uh, moms. However, um, there was an increased rate of terrible teratogenic problems and devastation like you wouldn't believe. When it was prescribed, people thought it was great. Benzodiazepines come to mind. I still remember when benzodiazepines were, were marketed. Uh, oh, they're going to get rid of anxiety. They're going to help, help people not to have stress. Don't worry, they're not addicting. I can remember being told that by the pharma rep that was telling me. And nobody else knew much about it, so we tried it. Guess what? It became very addicting to people. Profoundly addicting. Same thing with sleeping medications. As a psychiatrist, over the years I've prescribed thousands of um, antidepressants and antipsychotics and um, benzodiazepines to my patients. And now I'm looking back and sort of, and regretting it. I feel that some of these drugs are in, very difficult to come off. Um, they cause horrible side effects and um, they're not as helpful as cannabis might be for mood disorders or anxiety disorders. I do think that the medical community is changing its mind on this. However, there's a lot of uncertainty, there's still a lot of fear, and there's a lot of concern uh, with respect to this particular therapy. Uh, it's not that um, people can't see some of its merits and value. Uh, any objective physician has to acknowledge it's got some merits and its values. We don't have cannaboid, cannabis receptors in our bodies for no reason. The high CBD strains are the ones that are kind of the, the medicine part of the plant and they reduce inflammation, they reduce pain, they cause muscle relaxation, um, they make um, the gut sort of relax and so people can digest their food better. It's just, it's the, it's the sort of um, Tylenol part of the plant, I guess. Clearly, it seems that there's something that the CBD uh, aspect does in seizure disorders of some uh, very severe seizure disorders in some pediatric groups that are refractory to standard therapies. Um, so although there, this is still in the medical realm of what we call anecdotes, uh, surprising results in what we're seeing hasn't been studied clinically but needs to be in critically. Clearly there's something special about CBD and seizures in some pediatric uh, kids and that's critical because those kids have no chance in the future of any sort of a meaningful life without it. There are a lot of people who get um, anxious about the fact that they're getting marijuana and they fight the effects of the drug so they do not get the same results as people who embrace it and say this is, this is what I want to try. Um, the other risk that we all have to recognize is that it's not the perfect drug, it's not a magic drug. People do abuse it and become addicted to it, but it's not as common as the addiction rate to um, opiates. So it isn't for everybody, and we have to be very careful to do some damage control. Uh, the last thing that uh, any physician wants to see their patients suffering, or worse, get them hooked on narcotics. Right now, um, there is a large number of people that are hooked on narcotics, um, and um, those are devastating. There's lots of overdoses that are occurring because of narcotic um, usage. This is terrifying. So, I, so we have lots of bad medicines that we've used over the years. So we don't want more bad medicines. I do think that it has therapeutic options that are very intriguing and unique and I think needs to be explored because we need better therapies for patients. We have concerns about this, but I do think that there are a lot of concerns we have about every other medication. We may as well learn uh, through good clinical trials to, in, to learn to uh, find the benefits of these therapies, which I think are there.